Um, I guess, uh, well, first of all, I'm Chris Bird. I'm with the Alachua County Environmental Protection Department. I'm the director. I also serve as the chair of the National Association of Local Government Environmental Professionals. So with both of those um, assignments, there's a lot of talk about water that I'm, I'm involved with. And I, you know, I think we're about halfway through the speakers. And one thing, by the time you get to me, I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of good information this morning. Um, but it's sort of like one of those icebreaker things where the facilitator asks you to say something that you're thankful for. And by the time they get to you, somebody's already mentioned their wife, and somebody else has mentioned their dog, and somebody's mentioned their kids. And I think I did one of these a couple of weeks ago, and I said I was thankful for oranges. So anyway, you can always come up with something. Um, what, what I wanted to do, I think I, it was mentioned earlier, but I, I wanted to go ahead and mention it again. There are, if we're going to talk about springs and springs protection, you have to acknowledge what I think are the two biggest elephants in the living room. And I think they were mentioned this morning, but one of them clearly is the political influence of special interest money. And there's, I mean, there's no way you can deny that. Um, this is the week the legislative session starts, and um, you know there's a lot of that moving around in Tallahassee this week. And I know for me, when the session starts, it's hard for me not to get really snarky about things because we hear about a lot of stuff going on that's just um, really frustrating. And in the last few years, we've heard very little that really has to do with protecting springs, um, not, not on the ground anyway. So I, I think really that's just one of the underlying drivers. Um, we've got a lot of problems we can talk about today, but you do have to acknowledge sort of what's behind it. And we're not going to solve the, these kind of issues, the big issues today, we just need to be aware of. Um, the other big elephant is just the reality is that we've got just about, we've got 20 million Floridians now almost, and um, our water footprint is just a lot bigger than it was 100 years ago. Um, we have a, approximately the same amount of rainfall falling on the state in North Florida. <coughs> Um, some of that gets down in the aquifer, but if you go back a hundred years ago, we weren't pumping. There, there was very little pumping in the aquifer. There were like dug wells, and you know we have we have a lot. We have billions of gallons a day being pumped out of the aquifer. So those are just realities, and um, we aren't going to really change those. And again, it's not we're trying to talk too much about them. It's just important to understand how much they're driving some of the problems that we're experiencing. Um, we all got the same questions. I'm, I'm going to skip over, I think, some of, I think everybody up to now did a really good job of identifying what the problems are. I, I will mention a couple of things. I, I, we don't have adequate governmental frameworks, and I'll, I'll start at the local level. We don't. I don't think we do at the water management district level or at the state level or the federal level. All of those frameworks are lacking in terms of protecting springs. And I think we've heard some good ideas this morning about how we, we are moving in the right direction, but we, we have work to do and improvements to do on all levels of that. And um, also, there's, there is a continued lack of verified data at the spring shed scale. I think that's one of the challenges we've got. There's been a lot of data on the Florida aquifer. But if you really look around the state, um, we're starting to make some progress, but really trying to determine what's going on within a spring shed, we're really lacking in those areas. And, and so that's, um, that's going to be important if we're going to make good decisions and we're going to see restoration. And then um, I think the other issue is that we're still looking at downstream solutions. I think it was mentioned this morning uh, with the Wakulla Springs. The good news is that they were able to get the Tallahassee wastewater plant upgraded, and that's made a big impact. Um, like it was mentioned, that would, there's, probably without federal stimulus money, that wouldn't have happened. And that kind of money is dried up. And you know, one of the challenges is that if you, if you really wait until you have to go to these downstream solutions, they're so expensive that a lot of times they're just cost prohibitive and nothing gets done. And so we've really got to be looking upstream. And I've, I've got, I've, I'm a science and an engineer, but I can tell you that a lot of the solutions are not engineering solutions, or if they are, they're very expensive solutions. We've got to get more people involved upstream in the watersheds 
and a lot of it's got to be focused on preventing the, the pollution from getting in the aquifer in the first, first place or reducing the pumping. So again, some of those things are not engineering fixes. Um, so I guess I, the, I wanted to give one example of where I see some real hope, and, and that is what's going on with the Silver Springs spring shed work right now. It may just be the timing and, and you know, the wake up call may have been the Adena Springs permit. What, what I'm seeing though is there's a huge opportunity with the Basin Management Action Plan that's getting underway in Silver Springs. If you really look at that and the fact that the Water Management District is doing some really good work in trying to determine what the water budget is for Silver Springs, um, if, if those two processes can really come together, and I don't, when I, when I look at the Basin Management Action Plan, the plan we did for Orange, the Orange Creek Basin a few years ago, we really didn't think about water supply. I mean, that, it was a pretty good plan, but we really just didn't even think of that. But I think that the synergy between the Basin Management Action Plan process and some really good water budgeting on a spring shed level, um, that can be very powerful. And, and what I'm hoping comes out of that in time is that the district, the water management district, will really have a good foundation for making very prudent consumptive use permitting decisions. And uh, you know, that, so I, I'm really, I, I think we need to look at what's going on there. We need to support what's going on with Silver Springs. We all have our spring sheds that we care about, but I, I, I'm really thinking that that may be a great model as we move forward. And it may also help us with some of our basic management action plans that we're revisiting. Um, it'll really give us some good information to go forward with. So I, I, I wanted to uh, mention one of the issues that I see is that um, a lot of the citizens and local government groups, there's, there's just not enough good information. I, I wanted to give some examples. We have two somewhat competing um, <coughs> initiatives going on. We're in the local Florida, I guess it's Florida Leaders Organized for Water, Flow. That's a group that um, really got organized. I think their wake up call was being concerned about Jacksonville and their pumping. And um, it's, it's a group of local city and county commissioners from pretty much interior north central Florida. And um, there's a lot of enthusiasm. They're really starving for good information. And I, I think that's there's some there's some opportunity there for them to have a good conversation about water and really trying to identify what they can do. However, um, they they just so far they really have not gotten the kind of information they need. Um, and then I'll contrast that with another group that I think DEP and the St. Johns and, and Swanee River Water Management District put together, the North Florida Water Supply Partnership. I think it's what the stakeholders, if the, I got that wrong, I think it's North Florida Water Regional, Supply. Regional Water Supply Partnership. Yeah, but anyway, there's a partnership <laughs> committee that, um, it's, it's too long of an acronym, there's a partnership committee that got put together with that. And to kind of contrast that with flow, um, this committee is, um, it's the stakeholders are mainly representatives of consumptive water users. And I think there's an environmental group and a local government, and there's some reps from them. Um, but, but just in terms of looking at the contrast, um, the flow group, I, I would say, is under-facilitated, and they're starved for information. This other group, the Stakeholders Committee, is over-facilitated, and they're experiencing what I would say is information overload. So somewhere in between those two, I don't know if you can put them together, there's something probably in, in the middle of that that's the sweet spot. Um, but, but I do think what's good about both of those groups is that at least there's a really focused conversation about water. And that's been missing, I think, in, in a lot of what's been going on in, in North Florida. So um, I think both of those groups have the opportunity to really do some good things. And I, I'll, I think I'll wrap up. I'm going to run out of time. I, there, there's a line in a Bob Dylan song. Actually, I think the, the name of the song is the Subterranean Homesick Blues. And there's a line that says, um, you, don't, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And so I was thinking for Bob and maybe for this group, we could um, 
we could come up with some new lyrics and maybe a new title for that song, like um, I, the subterranean springship, springship blues. And, um, but if, if you do it, you have to have a line that you don't need a computer model to tell which way the water flows. Yeah. <laughs> and, um,
Thank you very much, Chris. Okay.